Thank you, and thank you for organizing this uh, panel, giving us a chance to reflect on the 25th anniversary. When I, when I got the invitation, I thought, 25 years? How time flies. Well, Sidel described very well the founding meeting of our association and gave a very good account of some of the institutional and political issues that, that we faced. I want to say something about the intellectual context, which was very much in our minds at Castel Gondolfo, because the discipline at the time was in the throes of a crisis and, um, in Britain and France, which were then still the two leading centers of social anthropology in Europe. It was a crisis which had a lot to do with the uh, ends of the colonial empires. And having lost their empires, as people were saying at the time, the anthropologists had to find a role, and this was by no means straightforward. They were being accused of being Orientalists who viewed colonial peoples as objects and constructed false and mystifying differences. Nationalists accused them of fostering or encouraging tribalism. According to dependency theory, human lives everywhere were ultimately shaped by multinational companies, and to emphasize local cultural differences was just to obscure these deeper realities. Now these charges of um, complicity and complacency were unsettling, but I think there was an even more fundamental question which had to be faced. We as anthropologists had to think again about the very nature of our scientific object. The native peoples of the colonial countries had once been loosely identified as primitives. By the 1970s, very few social anthropologists were using the old idiom of primitives or savages, except in a fit of absent-mindedness, or like Malinowski, ironically, or like Levi-Strauss with provocative ambiguity. Hardly any would probably still have claimed that there was a distinct category of tribal societies for which a special theory had to be constructed. Nevertheless, anthropology was associated with the intellectually indefensible and politically unsavory idea that the colonial peoples were uncivilized, backwards, and very different from European. Few anthropologists addressed these popular misconceptions. Perhaps, indeed, the old notions had been rather convenient, since they shielded ethnographers from ticklish questions about why they spent so much time in the colonies. And yes, even in the 1970s, many anthropologists did do their fieldwork in Africa, in Oceania, and the Amazon. And indeed, as development aid began to flow to the former colonies, a new applied anthropology emerged, not only in France and Britain and the Netherlands, but even more strongly and idealistically in Scandinavia and Germany. And this seemed to confirm that social anthropology was about, well, not primitive people, of course, perhaps not even tribes, but what were now called underdeveloped countries. So clearly, a more considered defense of research priorities was required. If those folk did not represent a different tribal world, why were they the privileged subjects for ethnographic research? And if social anthropology did not have its special field of research, a particular kind of society or culture, then what could it contribute to the broader discourse of the social sciences? Well, at the time, three possible answers were being floated, perhaps three and a half, but none were entirely persuasive. The first option was to insist, yes, social anthropologists did indeed have its special methods for doing research in, not heaven forbid, primitive societies. There was a search for euphemisms, pre-literate peoples. They had to still perhaps less patronizing the other, the non-Western. But anyway, the claim was something like this, that 
when it came to these other cultures, anthropologists could draw on a store of accumulated wisdom. And in short, we did have our proper subject matter, even if it wasn't easy to give it a name. And th that response is not altogether dead even now, I think. And I sense a certain primitivism, neo-primitivism, to be discerned in the new paradigm, which is called the ontological paradigm. But the claim that anthropology was about the exotic other was, however, problematic for many reasons, of course, but one of which was that local ethnographers in Asia and Latin America were making studies at home. Although actually, when you looked into it, usually in the poorest and most marginal communities in their countries. So there was a second claim, a second argument, which was at variance with the first, which was that the ethnographer's magic could work very well at home, or anyway, quite near to home. And of course, what was termed ethnology in many European traditions was exclusively concerned with national cultures. By the 1980s, some ethnologists, particularly I think in Scandinavia, were drawing on models from social anthropology, although social anthropologists tended to object that they operated without the discipline and perspective of comparison. But in any case, switching too much to doing fieldwork at home could hardly represent a new program for the discipline as a whole, unless perhaps social anthropology were to merge with sociology, bringing as a dowry only its questionable copyright on a particular method of collecting data. And in fact, of course, some people did seize on the ethnographic method as a guarantee of the anthropological project. In some quarters, I think, something of a sort of cult of ethnography has developed. And this might qualify as the half answer to this question with our anthropology. But of course, even ethnologists and sociologists were doing ethnographies, sometimes very good ethnographies. And in any case also, it was hard to justify piling up ethnographies in the absence of a thought out research paper. But if a cult of ethnography was not really a solution, then social anthropology had to face up to a very large problem. Because even more than development studies or ethnology, their identity was threatened ambition of the social anthropology discipline is threatened by sociology. Now, sociology was, of course, a well-established discipline in the United States, many European countries from the early 20th century. But until the 1960s, it had only a marginal presence in British universities. And it suddenly took off, encouraged by a Labour government, fueled by student demand. And at the same time, elsewhere in Europe, small, largely moribund sociology departments suddenly took off and attracted very large numbers of students. And the established social anthropology departments were terrified that they were going to lose their students to this uh, new discipline. Now the response, particularly I think in France and in Germany, where I know the situation a little bit, certainly in England, was that social anthropology just beat a retreat, or at least the establishment of social anthropology beat a retreat in the face of the challenge of sociology. And there was even a kind of simple response. Sociology, what was it about? It was about modern industrial society. Very well. Social anthropology was the science of the rest, the other cultures. Back then, to the first default response to the identity crisis, social anthropology as exotica. And it must be said that some of the very influential figures who were making this choice also favored very traditional topics of research. Even when their fieldwork took them to societies in the throes of revolutionary change, they typically chose to study cosmologies and kinship systems. Now, there was a third answer to this question, what are we doing over there, over here? <laughs> and that is that social anthropology could be the comparative wing of the social sciences. 
Do the generalizations of the social sciences apply to human beings in general or only to citizens of Western liberal democracies? Matthew Brown had famously said that sociological theory must be based on and continually tested by systematic comparison. And he was right. And who but trained ethnographers could put the propositions of the social sciences to the comparative test? Now, these were issues of subject matter and method, large enough. But when we met in Castle Gondolfo, it was, I think, evident that above all, social anthropology required <coughs> a fresh theoretical project. Where was this to come from? Could it come from our original uh, intellectual inventory? The challenge was that the established anthropological models tended to be based on the idea that the societies with which the anthropologists were engaged were monocultural and static. There was no room for the serious study of change. There was no room for the study of the interconnection of local societies with larger contexts. One of the consequences of this mismatch between the realities that ethnographers were engaging with and the field was intellectual equipment available for analysis was a sudden rise, challenge, new intellectual challenge in the 1970s of a new Marxist um, kind of anthropology, um, which seemed to address these questions of conflict, change, um, relationships of local societies, larger societies. However, I don't know whether it was the coming of Glasnost or whether other larger political and social movements were in train. But by the beginning of the 1980s, by the early 1980s, the Marxist cargo cult in anthropology was finished. And something new came in, a politics of identity, a politics of personal experience, which suggested to many anthropologists that the key word for understanding what they should engage in was not social class or even social structure, but culture. So the first time, really, in the 1980s, European social anthropologists began to take, pay serious attention to American cultural theory, and particularly as it developed in the hands of Clifford Goetz. And for a while, it seemed as though the interpretivist anthropology of Goetz and David Schneider was really taking over the whole of uh, the intellectual field of social anthropology. There was even a moment when there was a serious challenge, or so it seemed, from the extreme version of the culturalist paradigm which promoted itself rather misleadingly as postmodernism, with its extreme relativism, its extreme rejection of any kind of um, uh, comparison or any kind of general theoretical progress. Now, this seemed to us, I think I'm right in saying, 1988 in Castle Rodolfo, when we had our discussion, this seemed to us to be the way in which the established European social anthropological models were being challenged and a new response was needed. And I think that we all felt that the culturalist discourse excluded too much that was central in social anthropology. Politics was treated simply as rhetoric. Ethnic identity was just an ideological construction. Religions were reduced to cosmology. Kinship was just a symbolic statement about shared identity, not a system of working connections on which people depended for dear life. Economics was about conceptions of nature, production, reproduction, but excluded land, law, labor, budgets, calculations of profit and loss. Ethnographies were at best tentative essays in intercultural communication. But from the idealist point of view of the culturalist, life ways, life ways were so different as to be incommensurate. 
It was impossible almost to grasp how other people saw the world. But social anthropologists are interested in the conditions and organization of daily life. They're impressed by the recurrence of certain institutions, the limited range of variation, the common strategic responses to the problems of getting by, making do, rubbing along. An anthropology that situates itself in the social sciences will have a very different agenda to any cultural approach. And comparison is crucial. Very nearly all research funding in the human sciences is directed to the study of the inhabitants of North America and the European Union. 96% of the subjects are studied reported in the leading American psychology journals are drawn from Western industrial societies. According to The Economist magazine in a recent article, the leading economics journals publish more papers dealing with the United States than with Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa combined. And The Economist ended up by saying, the economics profession as it is today is the science of the rich. The world's poorest countries are effectively ignored by the profession. And so there is a room, there is a necessity for a comparative contribution to social sciences based on the kinds of ethnographic field methods which we have developed. And I think that it is that which we have somehow managed to maintain, sustain a space for within our association. And the association is no longer dominated by British and French intellectual traditions. A more cosmopolitan discipline has emerged, multi-centered, engaged in a range of current debates. The social science tradition is reasserting itself. I believe, really, that a new realism is abroad.